Hello again, friends. Welcome back to the Parsonage. It's Pastor Don from First United Methodist Church of Brazoria, and it's time for today's Stay at Home Daily Devotional. In the Gospel of John, we're told of an extraordinary encounter with Jesus. Here's what it says, quote, Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume, but Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Friends, 300 denarii was a lot of money in Jesus' day, roughly a, a year's wages for an average laborer. And that would make this some very expensive perfume Mary used to anoint Jesus that evening. The gospel tells us she poured a pound of pure nard upon Jesus' feet and then wiped the oily perfume off with her hair. Nard was a rare botanical fragrance. It was a rich man's prize and used for anointing the dead. It came from Persia, Iran, in large sealed alabaster jars. It was far from a necessity. It was an overt extravagance. Nevertheless, Mary broke it open and poured it over Jesus' feet to wash them. A, a first century act of welcoming usually performed by a slave. And this was a dual meaning act. First, it was an obvious sign of welcoming and humility. Second, it made Jesus literally the Messiah, or in Greek, the Christos, the anointed one of God. And Mary's actions served yet another more subtle purpose. It foreshadowed Jesus' death. It was an act of great love, generosity, humility, kindness, and even perhaps sadness, as Mary may have suspected her Lord's coming death. It was a gift that doubtless Mary could ill afford. Now, as I reread this passage, one point leapt out at me, the fragrance Mary poured a pound of a musky oil-based perfume on Jesus' feet and then dried the oil with her hair. In so doing, she undoubtedly absorbed the fragrance into her hair and onto her skin. And considering that soap had not yet been invented, she must have retained that fragrance in her hair and on her skin for weeks even perhaps months, and certainly she'd have smelled it any time the wind rustled her hair on the night our Lord was arrested. Likewise, she would have smelled it as she watched him hanging in death throes from the cross, and then as she waited for those three long days of uncertainty and, and anguish, she certainly would have smelled nard. And as she stood outside the empty tomb, it had become the fragrance of grace, the fragrance of, of Easter. Friends, when we act generously, we not only anoint others in kindness, we anoint ourselves as well. Quote, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me, unquote. 
When we, like Mary, practice extravagant generosity selflessly and humbly, we too share in the goodness, the, the fragrance of that act. God constantly practices extravagant generosity through the gift of grace. God calls each of us to be extraordinarily and extravagantly generous as well. But that's where we can get a bit weak need. I mean, there's generosity and then they're spending a year's wages on a jar of perfume to anoint one man, right? Thankfully, friends, God's grace doesn't have to make any practical financial sense. No earthly king ever gave his only son to ransom a a wayward, disobedient slave. Our God did and does. And, And when we give selflessly and humbly to make possible, quote, God's mighty acts of salvation, unquote, words taken directly from our baptismal vows, we are practicing extravagant generosity. We are, we are being merry when we simply show practical, logical human restraint and, and consider just the bottom line, we are being at least Martha's and perhaps Judas's. Friends, the good news is God will not let us fail. God will make each of us more than conquerors through his gift of Jesus Christ. We must, however, be bold and extravagant in our generosity as in our faith too. And this can be a real challenge, especially considering all our churches face the uncertainty wrought by the COVID-19 pandemic. But COVID or not, our church is in, we are the church, remember? We are called to more and greater service and ministry to our community. We are called to greater grace-filled generosity. We must look beyond the bottom line on a spreadsheet to the bottom line promise of our loving God. A promise written in blood on a cross and sealed by an empty tomb. We have been anointed to ministry and life by His own blood. Here we have a choice. Be a Mary or Judas. Do we choose and try and be as extravagantly generous as our Lord is and as generous as He calls, He commands us to be? Or do we show restraint? Do we hold back and say, whoa, enough is enough? If each of us practices extravagant generosity in our walks of discipleship, we, like Mary, will share in the lasting fragrance of God's grace. On the other hand, if we choose not to, we can share in Christ's scornful rebuke of his in-name-only disciple, Judas Iscariot. Leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Let's thank the Lord for His presence with us forever by doing His will and and ministering with boldness and courage to our world through acts, through ministries of extravagant generosity. Let's start ministering caring and sharing in bold, confident faith. And therein, let us start enjoying God's fragrant and abiding grace. Grace, peace, and good health. And have a blessed day.